That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Greenland, the sixth film directed by Rick Roman Waugh, which will be released in the US uh, December 18th, 2020, courtesy of X STX Films. STD Films. Do you know <laughs> Rick's other films? Yeah, so do you. Well, I'll name them. Well, he's a stuntman turned film director. Oh, okay. Uh, you saw his last film, which was the third in the Has Fallen trilogy, which was Angel Has Fallen, also okay. starring Gerard Butler. Um, I believe you also saw Snitch, which I remember being a pretty decent film with The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, of course, and um, Susan Sarandon back in 2013. Okay. Uh, he also directed a film called Shot Collar with uh, Nikolai Kostra Waldo and Omari Hardwick, which is pretty decent as well. All right, well, we're talking about Greenland. Greenland, which has been released in many other, most other places in the world uh, prior to the US. They save the best for last. Mm. Um, this movie is a natural disaster film. Man versus nature. Set in modern time. So we find a family mm -hmm. in Atlanta, Georgia, Mm -hmm. Joe, his wife Allison, and their kid Nathan. John. Joe is John. Not that it matters. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. <laughs> John Garrity. John is played by Gerard Butler. Mm -hmm. Allison is played by uh, Marina Baccarin, who who I swore was Gal Gadot, but Gadot. Gadot. Um, she looks like Gal Gadot, but uh, you, she's the Deadpool's girlfriend. She's beautiful. Yes, and, and she'll be uh, starring opposite Sigourney Weaver soon in The Good House. Oh, I don't know about them. Yes, you do. Oh, and then little Nathan. Uh -huh, played by Roger Dale Floyd. Who I thought was a good little actor. Yeah, actually, there were a couple. He gets a little moments of poignancy. Okay, I'm going to try to explain the story quickly. <clears throat> Atlanta, Georgia. We find out that there is a comet approaching Earth. Named Clark. Named Clark. And it's all over the news uh, that there's this comet with the comet with a trail of debris longer than scientists can even see that is going to impact Earth like in a few days. <laughs> Trails of debris. <laughs> but there's no need to worry because when the debris enters the Earth's atmosphere, it will sort of uh, disintegrate into gas and produce a beautiful light show, but nothing will hit Earth directly mm -hmm. or people land, whatever. Okay. So John is like in construction. He says he builds skyscrapers. His relationship to his wife Allison is strained because we find out he cheated on her. So she, um, they don't live together. However, we find that she's having a party. John is over. She asks him to leave to get like alcohol and mustard. So he takes little Nathan with him. While he's out, he gets a presidential alert, which is like an Amber alert, saying that he has been selected to be taken to shelter. Mm -hmm. And it's only him, his wife, and his kid. And they say the full first and last name and that they have to be at this like military base that night. Only bring one bag. You have to show a QR code we're going to text you. You can't bring anyone else. Come on. So he finishes his grocery shopping, drives home, asks his wife if he, she received anything. She says no. She seems kind of like she doesn't really. Well, she was blowing her, she was drying her hair when she missed the initial. Yeah, because the alert also showed on the TV screen, but she didn't hear it because she was drying her hair. Anyway, she seems kind of annoyed. And when she goes out to meet the rest of the party in the living room, the news shows that a part of the comet that's the size of like a two football fields or something hits Tampa, Florida and obliterates the city. So of course everyone's in shock. Mm -hmm. John hears like birds squawking outside. He chooses to go outside and the aftershock, so like 800 miles away or whatever, is like a tornado hit. So of course everyone's terrified. John gets another presidential alert explaining the same thing, also on the TV screen. So all of the adults at the party see it and they're all freaked out because none of them received the alert. So they leave. Mm -hmm. John and his wife and kid pack up their bag and leave. They make their way to the military base. They get there. 
when they realized, so an important plot point is Nathan has diabetes, type one diabetes. He wears an insulin pack. Of course they had to bring insulin, mm -hmm. but this little boy left the insulin in the car. Mm -hmm. And the process of getting from the car into the military base was stressful. Strenuous. Because yes. the news is speculating that the government is selecting people to be taken to shelter mm -hmm. and that they think they're meeting up at these military bases. So all these dum-dums are showing up at the military bases demanding to be let in. So when they get in and realize the insulin is missing, John decides to go back and get it. Mm -hmm. And Allison is stuck with Nathan. She's freaking out, asking everyone where her husband is. Like, damn bitch, he just left. But <laughs> She messes up and tells one of the military people, my son has diabetes, my husband went to get his insulin, and the person's like, oh, wait, we can't allow people with chronic illnesses in the shelter, so y'all need to leave. Mm -hmm. So she gets kicked out. John makes his way back in, but then he finds out from someone that sick people are getting kicked out, so he assumes that, which we'll get into, but that's stupid, so he decides to leave as well. Mm -hmm. Now they're separated. He communicates with his wife that he'll meet her. No, she She texts him to say, I'll meet you at my dad's house. She left a note on the windshield of the car. And she left a note on the windshield of the car. Because text isn't working for a while. His text isn't yeah. working. So they're separated. And the middle third of the film is Allison and Nathan and then John separately trying to get to Knoxville. Where Scott Glenn lives. Where uh, Allison's dad lives. Mm -hmm. So with Allison and Nathan, Allison gets picked up by this couple and they decide to give her a ride up north. Uh -huh. But the couple, the husband in particular, notices that both of them are wearing wristbands. So of course he decides to steal the wristband. He, kicks out Allison, steals her wristband, kidnaps Nathan, drives to the military base, mm -hmm. a different military base, and attempts to get in. But they're not successful because Nathan says, these aren't my parents, they kidnapped me. So they get taken, now Nathan is stuck at the military base. Allison makes her way there via a car full of Spanish speakers, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which was silly. John, somehow makes his way onto a truck filled with people who are going to Canada mm -hmm. because apparently there are pilots, like private pilots in Canada, somewhere in Canada, that big ass country, who are flying people because we learned that the shelter is in Greenland, hence the title. Mm -hmm. So he makes his way up there to, he, he gets on the trucks wanting to go north so he can get to Knoxville. He has some trouble, but he does make it to Knoxville. They're reunited at Scott's house. When his name's Dale. And Dale. When John says, we're going to Greenland. Now, despite every, the scientists not knowing that these big ass pieces of the comet are gonna destroy Earth. It's pretty bad miscalculation. Super bad miscalculation. They didn't figure that out, but they know exactly when the largest piece of the comet is going to hit, which is like in 17 hours. The planet killer. And it's like a nine mile, it's like nine miles in diameter or something, mm -hmm. and it will create an extinction level event. So they have like 17 hours to get to Greenland mm -hmm. from Knoxville. And John is like, let's do it. We can drive to Canada. And then from there, someone somewhere in Canada will fly us to Greenland. So they do it really without incident, except at a point it's like raining fire because the smaller pieces of the, the comet are hitting earth. Mm -hmm. They get there, get on the plane, which we'll get into because that was a really annoying scene. Make it to Greenland. Military people pick them up and let them go in like a bunch of people. Everyone who was on the plane, even though they don't have wristbands. The comet hits earth, <clears throat> destroys everything. And these people are safe. It appears that a few moments after, well, so then what happens is as the comet hits, we get a bunch of flashbacks of John and Allison's like happier times. Then we get a montage of like sort of a shot of the globe and then shots of every city 
like all the large cities that were destroyed. But while that's happening, we hear like radio transmission from Greenland trying to find other people. And then we start hearing that, oh, in Helsinki, in Moscow, Berlin, mm -hmm. Moscow, wherever, all these people survived. Mm -hmm. So mankind will persist. The final scene of the film is the Greenland shelter. What, what appears to be only a short time after the impact, they open the doors while the earth is still scorched and singed, all these dum-dums run out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, out into their brave new world. All right. So, <clears throat> how do you feel about this movie? I thought it was very silly and looked uh, a lot cheaper than I was expecting it to. Yeah. Um, where, where to begin? Uh, Gerard Butler's accent. Oh, well, he's supposed to be Scottish. He's supposed it? to be Scottish. But it sounds like he's failing at his own accent. Yeah, how do you mess up your own accent? <laughs> it goes in and out. And it, but his character is directly referenced because it's like his mother-in-law, who's now dead, wore a kilt upon their first Yeah, meeting. they reference the fact that he's Scottish. Yeah, it's very bizarre. Um, the presidential alert is supposed to... So initially, it, it mimics like what an amber alert looks and sounds like, but then when he opens it, the graphics are so bootleg, and it says presidential alert. From the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I, I wanted someone to talk about how alarming that it was that he is a, maybe a contractor for the government, whatever, that they not only have access to your phone, they, they pre-selected you without your knowledge and on your flat screen television to blast that across there. I thought that was the most terrifying part of uh, the, this suggestion. Uh, but, mean, but nobody's worried about that. Like nobody even brings it up because it's the plot mechanism that these people are selected based on their occupations because the government knows they're gonna need people to rebuild the world. So they need doctors, they need Architects, blah blah blah, blah, blah which blah, is yeah. kind of the backbone of that film, Passengers, with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, where he's yeah. like blue collar and she's, or however that situation was. Oh, all these like disaster films where everyone has to be affected. Like this married couple can't just be a happily married couple. They have to be, you know, having conflict because of him cheating on her, and of course the little boy has to have diabetes. I think that's kind of corny yes because it, it it's meant as a way to kind of humanize them or give them this kind of universal appeal but the parameters of it are so like they're from the 1950s even the way they're talking about his his infidelity to oh, his, to, to scott glenn who's very corny collins in this and I know you'll never forgive me for cheating on your daughter. It's like is it 1955 like shut the fuck up when the three of them first leave the house uh, the neighbors, who, by the way, were treating John kind of shitty because mm -hmm. they know that he cheated on Allison. When he leaves, because they all know he got the alert to go to shelter, they want him to take them with him. And one of the neighbors, the one who is rolling her eyes at him when he first enters the party, jumps in front of the car and says, please take my son. Daughter. And he's our daughter, whatever. And Allison is like, well, why can't we bring them? Oh, I was so mad. Like, bitch, you want, then you stay. Like, the, these, the, the, these characters are, are on some white people shit. Oh. Uh, because in the end, which might be skipping ahead in your notes, when they stop the plane from going to Greenland, driven, that's flown by, driven, float by um, Holt McCallany from Manhunter. Let me tell you something. I was so upset because the, oh my God. First of all, the fact that they even knew where this like landing strip was to get on this plane but gerard butler's character he's driving this big truck he like blocks the runway so this plane can't go mm -hmm. and then he has like a fit like if you don't take me then no one can go yeah mm -hmm. a plane full of people trying to get to safety and he and the pilot is like i can't take you we're overweight like will crash which they end up crashing because the plane's overweight and the pilot dies and the pilot dies but john is like no if if we can go no one can go oh i was so mad i think we need to have a disaster movie that shows the ridiculousness of the, this this privileged perspective and all of them dying and all of them because yeah. it, it in fact this reminded me most of the movie 2012. Remember with John Cusack, mm -hmm. where that whole thing with, with all the people were, were the wealthy elitists who had access to these protective bunkers? 
Um, when John makes his way from the base to Knoxville, he hops on a truck with the people who want to go to Canada. And one of the men in the truck is this black guy who I recognize. Do you know who that I actor is? I didn't recognize him. Anyway, very friendly man. And they talk and he explains like his mom is a doctor and she got selected, but they're estranged. Once again, always having this extra drama we don't need. He's a, like, he's estranged from her, so he didn't get selected. But then when... So then that black man tells John, come with us, go to Greenland with yeah, us. There's like, he's like, no, I have to get my family. And then the guy's like, well, after you get your family, meet us there. Yeah, there's an instant bonding. Like, why? why? Would you, <laughs> um, <laughs> because first of all, none of y'all are allowed in the shelter according to the news. So why would you think you're gonna get on? And then why would you think to bring extra people? Right, right. Uh, the woman who was responsible for telling Allison that she ultimately couldn't bring her son into the plane initially, remember the black woman who's like, my family wasn't selected at all. That was a very good scene. That was a good scene, but I looked her up, um, her other major film credit, she's in Deep Impact. Oh. <laughs> So very similar uh, two of my favorite scenes the one with so when it is explained to Allison that your son cannot be in shelter because he has diabetes so y'all both need to leave the person who you just mentioned is like in charge and Allison is on her white woman shit telling her like you have to let me on what if this was your family and that lady goes military personnel's family were not selected for shelter like face crack mm -hmm. that was such a good scene mm -hmm. the other really good scene is when nathan when he's kidnapped and those people take him to the military base and they're getting in and the military person's kind of confused why their wristbands like aren't whatever and then nathan says like these aren't my parents that was a really good scene oh that that white lady who I was, I was looking at her in several scenes because they she's pilfering in the pharmacy when they're mm -hmm. trying to get him insulin. That's how they hook up with her. I'm like, God, that looks a lot like Hope Davis. And it is. I haven't seen her in <laughs> anything in forever. Uh, but she, there's Hope Davis in this throwaway role. The most ridiculous scene of the film, I think, is when Allison finally figures out, like she goes to the military base and she keeps saying, my son's missing. Like she knows that he must be there and then the people are like, well, because she keeps saying he has diabetes, blah, blah, blah. So they're like, well, go check like the medical center. Mm -hmm. So somehow she's allowed to go to the medical center, even though she doesn't have a wristband. And then literally this very friendly man is like, well, here, let's go look in all the wards. Mm -hmm. All these tents. yeah, <laughs> All these tents. And they must look through like five of them. Is your son in here? No. Okay, how about in here? No. Okay, how about in here? The sixth tent, he is in there. Mm -hmm. And she's reunited. And then this like angel of a nurse walks in who couldn't be more calm. Couldn't I be know, more I'm like, uh, the world's When ending. literally in 18 hours, the world's going to explode. And this bitch is like, oh, we took care of him. We gave him whatever. I made you a care package. Of insulin of, strips. Like insulin strips, uh, insulin, uh, whatever, glucose tabs. Then Alice is like, well, we need to get to Knoxville to like whatever. And the nurse is like, well, I'll call the bus for you and they'll take you up there. Yeah, she just got her customer uh, service certificate or something. Oh my God, that was so dumb. Um, it, so it was written by Chris Sparling, uh, who wrote Buried with Ryan Reynolds, oh. directed by Rodrigo Cortez, which is a film I'm a fan of. He also did Down a Dark Hall with Cortez, featuring Uma Thurman with a very questionable accent, um, and The Sea of Trees, a Gus Van Zandt film that's in, considered to be infamously bad. Um, but this felt like a lot of things get skipped over for the convenience of hurrying along the plot. And this is not unlike most films of this nature. So it's not unreasonable. It's just when you combine that it looks cheap, the acting is kind of questionable and the stories like some plot points are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of laughable. I mean, this is at about the level of San Andreas, uh, I think, which again, it, You've seen worse, but it's not good. No. Um, like worse would be something like Geostorm. The man who with plays Allison's dad. Scott Glenn. I thought he was okay, but when we first meet, he's written poorly. And when we first mm -hmm. meet him, he's pretty crunchy. Mm -hmm. And that I thought it was funny that uh, that man, 
when he sees his grandson, he's like, do you want some pancakes with a bunch of syrup? <laughs> Your little diabetic grandson. And then yeah. he begins to make them. Yes, he's like, like he's fully into They're like, we don't have time, we have to leave. He's like, I'm gonna make those pancakes. That's all I have. Poor Scott Glenn. Um, yeah, I don't know. You, it, generic in a way that it'll remind you of a ton of films. There's, there's a 2012 Norwegian film called The Wave, which even that Norwegian film felt very generic to me that a lot of people seemed to like at that time. Even that new George Clooney movie, The Midnight Sky, where he's in the Arctic Circle. There I like this movie that. better than The Midnight Sky. Sure. Uh, well, that was more entertaining. There, this is more entertaining because there's definitely more happening on screen. It's just that none of the characters are innately likable. They're, I'm just gonna say I'm so tired of these um, disaster films or apocalypse films where these characters are not, they don't seem human. Mm -hmm. And then to give them these like random issues, just make them normal people living a normal life that having an extraordinary thing happen. They to might them. as well just be as dull as they ultimately are. Uh, what would you give this movie? Uh, one and a half out of five. I would give it one and a half out of five as well. Thank you.